trial error. No, no, no. Because it is possible. Oh, so let's first of all say it's never possible to turn a parent into a child. But it is possible that a reference that's pointing to a parent is really pointing to a child. Yeah? If I've got a reference to a parent, it could be pointing at a child, couldn't it? Because children is a parent. Oh. That doesn't make sense, does it? Word-wise, it doesn't make sense. Child, but child is a parent. Child extends parent. So child, yeah, that's a really bad, should have picked better words than child and parent. Um, OK, shh, 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 shh. forget I said all that. Returning to this. Um, it's possible if I've got a pointer to a, if I've got a pointer to a child, it's definitely a child. If I've got a pointer to a parent, it could be pointing to a parent, or it could be pointing to a child under the extends thing we've got set up here. So I could have a pointer to a parent that was actually pointing to a child, is what I'm trying to say. Does everyone agree with that? That's what we had here. That's what P2 was. It was really pointing to a child. So it's legitimate, in some cases, to cast a child into a parent, because it might be a parent that's looking to be a child that you're now converting back into a parent, like one of those crazy Arnold Schwarzenegger movies where he swaps brains with a four-year-old kid or something like that. <laughs> and this is the end of the movie. So, so this is OK. Let's just go. So it's not a compile error, because that's going to be legitimate under some circumstances. Let's just go back here. So I could say, uh, let's just copy all this out. You know what I should have said to you? I should have said try it and see, shouldn't I? But we're going to try it and see now. But that's normally what we do. This is why I wrote all this stuff. Well, this is why I wrote another thing that isn't this, but gave me the idea to do this. I wanted to try something and see, because I wasn't sure how Java treated one particular strange little case. OK, so we're going to say, um, up here we could say child C3 equals child of P2. So cast P2 to a child. Oh, chili. <laughs> so no, I know that's not what you wanted, but I'm saying that's legal. So this line here, the compiler has to accept that. So this is an example of a parent reference being cast to a child. So it's legal. So the compiler can't tell this isn't right. So the compiler will let this through. So the compiler will even let through uh, if a... Um, yeah, no, it's not going to work here because it can probably tell inside a function. But if it's something's passed a parent in and it doesn't know where it's coming from, someone gets past a parent, then you can cast it to a child. Now, that will only work if it really was a child or something that can be cast to a child. If you try and cast a, a real parent object to a child, it's just going to explode. And Java will throw a... What error does it give? Does anyone know? Illegal... Cast exception. Error, probably. Yeah, yeah. Let's write a function. Uh, cast. Cast. Uh, public static void cast to parent uh, child C. So this function here is going to take in a child and go Turn it into a parent. Parent p equals. Have I got it the wrong way around? Yeah. Oh, I want to cast to a child. Thank you very much. <laughs> parent p. Child C equals uh, oop, child P. And then we'll do something with it so it won't compile it out. C dot um, speak. So. OK, so that should all compile. So it's fine to cast. Um, oop. It's fine to cast a parent into a child. But we've got to make sure when we pass something in that it really is a child. So if I now up here said uh, cast to child uh, P1, which is my real parent from all the way up here. Oh, no, P, sorry. Uh, now what's going to happen here? Let's run it. 
java.lang class cast exception. So it throws an exception at runtime. Yeah. You've got to be careful with your cast because if you're casting, if you're casting up, it's fine. If you're casting down, whoa, it might work, it might not. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's tricky. Okay. Is everyone cool? Let, shall we? Um, not, none of us are cool, are we? But let's, um, <laughs> you guys are cool. <laughs> yeah. Let's, I, I just want to show you this code. Well, uh, I don't know. We're sort of running out of time to do what I wanted to do. So I'm going to save a little bit of time by not showing you the code because you've already seen it. This is the code for creating a client connection. Do you remember that? and for creating a, a socket connection and a client, okay. Now I want you to think about your, um, your networking task this week. As you know, your task this week is to write an, a networking, uh, like a, a filter that makes and accepts HTTP connections and then makes HTTP connections and then gets an answer and forwards it back. And it sits in the middle like the, um, the dude, Senator Conway, and it just takes the responses that come back in and senses them in subtle ways and returns them. So someone browsing by passing through the, you're writing essentially a proxy server this week, someone browsing the internet using your proxy server gets, looks like they're getting all the actual pages as they browse around the internet, but the pages are being subtly changed in surreptitious and amusing ways. Okay, so that's what you have to do. Now, you're all, who's writing it already? Who started writing it? Okay, let's just pick someone. Let's pick, you, uh, what's your name? David. All right, David, you started writing it. You wrote it yesterday? I haven't actually, I haven't done a lot of work on it, but I, I, started, uh, I started using the classes you provided. Yeah, you started using the classes. Okay, um, I just want to find someone who's done a bit of work on it. No, there's, there's no problem that you haven't. I just want to find someone who has. I started doing some of the, passing along some of the. You started it's setting it up. Not, it's not that simple. But it's not that simple, yeah. What do I want you guys to always do before you write any code? Write tests. Write tests. Write unit tests. Now, I've noticed that early on in the course when we were giving you acceptance tests, which aren't unit tests, do you know the difference between acceptance tests and unit tests? Acceptance tests test the overall behavior from the client's point of view. They would only be any good if they could test every possible execution path and every possible thing that your program can go through. There's no way they can ever do that because your program is capable of very complex behavior. So acceptance tests can never be more than the client getting a vaguely good feel about what's going on. On the other hand, unit tests, which test small pieces of code, self-contained pieces of code that we'll call units, they can be exhaustive. You can test every unit exhaustively sometimes or do a jolly good job on it. So when you chain units together, the total number of paths multiplies, the number of paths in this unit times the number of paths in this unit. So if you did an acceptance test, you'd have to write the number of tests you need for that times the number of tests you need for that times the number, yeah, to get all combinations. But the idea of unit testing is if you test each individual unit, you're just going to write that many tests plus that many tests plus that many. Does that make sense? So we like testing down low level. So we like our tests to be really, really small. Zooming in, you just test five lines, you test each method, you run a unit test for every small thing you do. Now I've noticed people have started drifting out of the habit of writing unit tests, perhaps thinking we're not going to be looking for them or anything. And in a sense, we won't be looking for them as closely as we did in the second course because we think we'll catch you out. We think if you don't write them, your code will be wrong. And so we'll, you'll, you'll be caught out because the unit tests are there to help you. But by not explicitly testing for them, I think we're encouraging people not to write them. So can I just tell you, please do write your unit tests. They're what gives you reassurance whenever you change anything on a refactor that you haven't broken anything. Your acceptance test probably won't break if you, change a small, if you make a subtle error, but you, you want every error to be flagged as soon as you make it. So please keep writing your unit tests. Now, What's the problem with writing unit tests for your proxy server, the big brother proxy server? Hard it's hard to test. Why is it hard to test? This is why I wanted to find someone who's actually writing the code now, who's tried to test it. Is there anyone that's tried to test it and run into problems? Yes, you've tried to. I Dylan. Tested You've tested a method that did filtering? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so you could test that method. But how do you test, I don't know, your, the actual, um, uh, how do you test the actual overall behavior of the client side? Uh, yeah, I just opened up Firefox and 
Yeah, yeah, do manual testing. And, but you can see manual testing isn't the solution. It's what we do for debugging, but it's no good. You don't run those tests automatically. They're a pain to run, so you run them not all the time. You don't run them every time you make a small change. The idea with refactoring and writing our code is we want a big suite of automated tests that's it's just as easy to push the button and run the test as not. And if that's how easy it is, that's probably the only time I'll ever bother to run the test. So we want to be able to run, push a button and run 5,000 tests. Push a button and run 5,000 tests. But it's actually really hard to test the network functionality because the bits all live together and they communicate over a network. And what if you haven't got a network running? How can you test it? And it's really hard. Can everyone see that this is a difficulty? Where well, you've got a system like this where there's a strong dependency between the components. And here, each of the components is dependent on the existence of the network and the network working properly. So the components are both dependent on each other and also dependent on the network level underneath to do anything. So it's very hard to test them independent of the network. The best you can do is just test small methods individually, that don't the methods that don't involve the networking, and move as much functionality into methods that don't use networking as possible, which just sounds like what you did, so that's good. But nonetheless, there's still some methods that use networking that set up connections, tear them down and do stuff. How are you going to test that? It's really hard. So, this is a coupling problem. So I want to talk about something called, um, so I want to just say that is a problem, and this is a common problem, and it exists with GUIs as well. When you write a GUI, it's very hard to test it, other than getting people sitting there playing around with a GUI, because your code sort of depends on the GUI working, and depends on things being on the screen and things like that, so how can you test the logic? You can't scan pixels and check the right pixels are set and things like that, so how do you automatically test it? It's very, very hard. Anything that interacts tightly with other parts and other systems is very hard to test by itself. So the strategy we're going to use to test these things is something called mocking. Has anyone heard of mocking? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, what, do you, you want to have a shot at telling us what it is or? Uh, it's where you have, um, you create like objects. So certainly in the case of a GUI, you would have all your controls and do all the logic, but then you would have sort of objects that call those controls and check that things come back the way you think yes. they do? Uh, uh, so you have like mock objects of your... Yes, yes, that's it. That's, that's, that's right. Say. That's right. Yes. So the idea being, all right, you've got your GUI. You've got your GUI code. I don't know, I don't know. you've got a whole lot of code that runs a, a, a button. Okay, so you've got some button. A J button. There's a whole lot of code. You know, you've got some code that overrides J button and does all this stuff and it's got all these methods and internal logic and it's this widget that's a button and it's very hard to test because it's moved out of the land of being testable and into the land of displaying things on the screen. And then your system interacts with the button in certain ways and it's supposed to do things when the button is pushed and registrations are supposed to be made when the button uh, when you initially register with the button then updates are sent to your method when the button's pushed and depending on when and where the button's pushed and maybe how it's pushed, different things in your system are supposed to happen. And now it's very hard to test your system without actually going and pushing that button in all the different places in all the different orders and times you could do it. That makes it really hard. So the idea is you write your system and you give it a mock button. You write a mock button and a real button. And you don't let your system interact directly with the mock button. Your system, with the real button, your system uses an interface, which is your button interface, say. You write an interface here. And this widget implements the interface, and your mock object also implements the interface. And the idea is when you're testing this code now, you test it not with this class in there, but you stick the mock class in there. And all the mock class does is it mocks the behavior of a button. So it'll accept a registration request and store it, say, and then after a while it says it's been pushed. And that's all it does. Or maybe if you need to test what happens if it's pushed three times, after a while it says in quick session, I've been pushed, I've been pushed, I've been pushed. Whatever the test is you want to do. And your mock object, in other words, has behavior hard-coded into it, so no one needs to push an actual button. It fires off all the things that would happen were someone to push a button. It fires them off. Does that make sense? So another time people use um, mock objects is with a database. That's a classic example. I've got a bit of code that's looking after my video store records uh, library system that I've written. And underneath is a client database. And when someone tries to borrow something, I have to look them up and check they're in the client database and extract their MasterCard number and various things like that, or <laughs> overdue history. Uh, and 
It's very hard now to test that code without having the database sitting there. So if you write unit tests on your system and you don't have the database plugged in, then the functionality doesn't work because it expects to be able to do database lookups to run the methods. So what you do is you don't actually have your high level functions directly calling the database. Instead, you write an interface that the database implements and you also write a mock database. And when you're testing it, you give it the mock database. You plug the mock database in instead of the real database. And all the mock database does is when it, when it gets a request, is Richard in the database, it just says yes. It doesn't even bother looking it up. And you've written a test that checks if Richard's in the database and does things, various things. And now the first step when it checks if I'm in the database, it just mindlessly returns yes without actually consulting a database. So you hard code the actual test in. Does that make sense? The actual pattern of behaviors that you'd expect it to do were there to be a real database there and now just hard coded in. So you could even be the first time someone says, is this in the database, you say yes. The next time they say, is it's in the database, you say no. And the time after that, you say yes. Maybe that's how you code it. And now you can run three tests on it. The first one assuming something's in the database. Does that make sense? So you just need to replace them. So this is called mocking. It's this really brilliant idea. You've done it with networking. Done it with, oh, yeah, so you should do it with your network. So for testing your network thing, you would write, um, I had that code that we were going to go and look at, the code with the horrible duplication in it. Remember that sets up a connection and it gives you a read, a send and a receive method? I'm hoping you guys are going to refactor that and make it all beautiful so it doesn't have this duplication. But at the end of the day, you're going to have something that has a send and receive. And when you send, it sends it to the server. And when you receive, you get the message back from the server if you're at the server end and vice versa if you're at the client end. So I'm assuming that if you wanted to test that, here's what you'd do. You'd write an interface that that connection object would satisfy. And you wouldn't in your code ever say, give me a connection object, because that ties you to that particular instance. That ties you to that particular thing. You have, if you say, what did I call that? I can't remember what I called it. A, a socket connection or something. Client connection. If you said, give me a new client connection, or if you're storing the connection inside and you go client connection C or something, you're doomed, because now you're locked into using that actual class. Instead, come up with an interface, which is called, I don't know, network connection, which a client is an instance of network connection. And now, instead of giving it a network, so sure, you could give it a client connection, and you will when you're running the system live, but when you're testing it, you give it a mock client connection. And all that does is when someone does a send, you do nothing. And when you do a receive, you pump back hard-coded what you expect to get. Does that make sense? And your mock object could even store what was put in when they did a send, and then maybe your test could be querying the mock object directly to find out if they sent the right thing. Yeah, the mock object could just remember everything it's told, and part of your unit test could be, after the thing's run, speak to the mock object and say, by the way, their request should have been this, this, and this, was it? And the mock object goes, yeah, sure it was. And now you didn't have to sit there sniffing the network connection to see it. It's actually code, hard-coded into your test, and now you can run it 10,000 times. Does that make sense? So that's called a mock object, and that's mocking. It's very, very cool. So why do we want to talk about mocking? Uh, well, I wanted to talk about something called the dependency inversion principle. And it follows most things in the world that the things with the long, complicated sounding names are very simple. And the truly profound things have very short names. Yes? Before we leave mock objects, uh, yes. well, how do you know that the mock object works? Oh, how do you know the mock object works? Yeah. Um, so this is always a case with our tests. It's who will test the tester. Yeah. yeah, so you make the mock object as simple as possible. If your tests are ever so complicated, ever involve testing structures that are so complicated you're nervous about them, then you better test the test as well. You better write unit tests for the mock objects. Okay. But the idea is you try and make the code that runs on your tests as simple as possible. The idea is, let's talk about, well, like what does testing involve? I told you before, I told you a lie. Oh, all these lies from today. It's a bit like uh, Anzac Day. Let's have a look. I told you that duplication was bad. And I said it over and over again, and you believed me. But actually, duplication isn't always bad. Sometimes duplication is good. When's duplication good? Think about it as system designers. When do you like duplication? When's it a feature, not a problem? Can anyone think of an instance when you'd be writing code and you really like to have duplication? Yes. A test? Yes, yes. Explain why, George. Um, because 
you want to test something and then see if it's true, and then you want to test pretty much the same thing but a little bit different. Oh, uh, okay, you want to run a series of related tests. Yeah, but I still would say you wouldn't want duplication then. You'd want to have the common part of each test in a module that... Yeah, I wouldn't want to see duplicated code. If you're running this similar tests over and over again, I would expect you to probably extract bits out, probably. Although maybe with kitten simplicity idea, you don't want to have any extra structure from extracting that. Yeah, yeah. But related to that in testing, yes? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, can I, um, give me an example. I'm just not quite sure if it's exact, uh, it, I was just about to say it's exactly what I wanted, but I'm not quite. Um, you, you're certainly right, it's about, um, he, here's an example, why I'd want to a system with duplication. I'm the space shuttle. We're launching off. There's a control computer, which is running Windows. I don't know why they do that. Um, uh, but Windows sponsors NASA. Um, good old Microsoft. Uh, so you're running Windows on it. Um, and it has to make a whole lot of split level decisions, including shall we explode or not? And you should only explode if uh, There's no other option. Yeah, there's no alternative. If you're returning to Earth, and you've been taken over by an alien, and if you landed, it would destroy the whole planet. So there's got to be, under those circumstances, you should blow up rather than return to Earth. But under all other circumstances, you shouldn't. So there's an API function in there, blow up rocket. Okay, now, can you see, how would you like the system to be set up? If you were literally on the space shuttle, and it literally had a blow up feature, and it was literally controlled by a computer running Windows or Linux or Mac or anything, a computer, let's just say, or even not a computer, it's controlled by a man that has to decide if you wanted to blow up or not. Okay, you've got the President of the United States, he's walking around with a football. Inside the football, if he opens it up, there's a button, he pushes it, everything's finished. What, what would you like to have in place? Redundancy. Some redundancy. Why would you like redundancy? Uh, reduces the chance. Reduces the chance of error. Whenever there's a system where an error will be catastrophic, we quite like doing the same thing a couple of times and just checking. So, on the actual space shuttle, they actually do have four or five Windows machines all linked together. And whenever they make a decision, they vote on it. And if one of the machines goes completely nuts, that's okay, because you've still got some other sane ones there. <laughs> Just like in America, they have that fake president following the real president with an actual football. <laughs> no, that's just my dream. So, uh, okay. So, Redundancy is quite good if we're worried about ca catastrophe or things going wrong. Sometimes we like, or um, if you're an accountant, uh -huh. if you're an accountant and you're adding up a page of not figures on a book, you've got all these numbers, you add them up this way and you get the total. But you might have made a mistake. So what do accountants always do? Uh, and you might have, uh, well, what, the, what they normally do is they compute checksums of each of these items. Then they sum all the checksums together, and then they check that the checksum of this item equals the checksum of that item. In fact, if I wanted to draw a picture, there's summing and checksum should be exactly the same as checksum then summing. And they work it out both ways and cross-check. And if you've got a double entry bookkeeping system, it's the same thing. You work out your one thing in the double entry, entry one, and then you work out the other thing. And you check that at the end, they've both got the same answers. And that means either two of your employees are frauding you or you're okay. So we quite like doing things twice when we're nervous about them going wrong. And if we're not sure what's going to make them go wrong, we quite like doing them twice in different ways. So if there's a mistake on one path, hopefully there won't be a mistake on the other path and we can compare them. And if you think about testing, that's all we ever do with testing. We say um, you call the sum function x equals sum... Uh, x equals sum of 1, 4, 7. This is one of my test functions. And then I go assert x equals what? 12. 12. Can you see we've done the same thing twice but two different ways and the assert is that the two things match. So we quite like duplication when we're testing because we like doing things in two different ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, what was this coming to? Someone asked a question. What was the question? Was 
No one asked a question? <laughs> did I? Uh... <laughs> now, someone did. I was just about to talk about the dependency inversion principle and was it George or Kitten? There was someone over there who said one last question before we leave mocking. Oh, so how do you know the mock's right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> so what we do when we're testing is we try and do things in multiple paths and check the answers are the same. And this is redundancy that we, due to duplication we do like because we're hopefully duplicating the things in different ways and the error will appear in one and not the other. It's like balance signals on a microphone wire. You know, you send the, both wires down the cable and at the end they just look at the difference between the signals and the idea, the plus and the minus wire. The idea being that any interference will jaggle across both the plus and the minus wire. So if you look at the differences, any electromagnetic interference that attacks the cable will get knocked out at the end. It's only the differences that get carried through. It's the same sort of thing. We're approaching it in two different ways. So how do we know that our mock objects are good? Well, what we normally want is we have uh, a whole lot of complicated computation and a whole lot of complicated computation and some comparisons and moving across. And the idea being, this is where we think the error is going to be in the computation. So we make that step as small as possible in the mock object. Yeah, we remove as much complexity out of that path as we can. But we duplicate the, old, the whole system, but we do it on pen and paper ourselves and hard code the answer in, or we you know, do something else. But somehow we don't have much complexity in here, so that hopefully uh, we, we're fairly reliable about this. But even if even if we didn't get it right, and this was the point that I'm slowly, <laughs> laboriously getting to, even if our mock object isn't right, because we're just checking that these two sides commute, are the same thing, if the mock object has an error in it, it's very unlikely our code will have exactly the same error in it that behaves the same way in all circumstances. So bizarrely enough... So you spend hours debugging your... No, no, no. Bizarrely enough, your code is debugging the mock, is testing the mock object as well. Yeah. Yes, so when you debug, you better check, yeah. Take nothing for granted. Yeah, 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 yeah. Make your mock object as simple as possible, but you're probably going to be okay if there's a mistake in it because the systems, the two sides aren't going to match up. Yeah. Okay. Whew, that was an incredibly long answer for an incredibly short question. Um, so I wanted to talk about the dependency inversion principle. Now, the dependency inversion principle, dependency inversion principle, is a very fancy way of just saying you should essentially allow mocking to happen. So the normal way of writing code, when we started writing code in our first year was we'd have a high level function and that would call lower level functions. And we'd do top down design and those lower level functions would call lower level functions. And those lower level functions called lower level functions. Those lower level functions called lower level. Right? And we'd do a top down design like that. Do you remember that? And we really liked that. There were all sorts of neat properties about that. And now we've flipped to the Java OO world, you've probably noticed we're going a bit backwards. We tend to build these components and then assemble them into bigger and bigger components. We tend to be sort of almost going bottom up now, building our systems. What the dependency inversion principle says is the lower down, more detailed stuff should not be relied upon in any concrete way by the higher level stuff. So it's not the case that high-level code depends on low-level code details. It should just depend on a low-level code abstraction. It's a very elaborate sentence, but if I give you an example, it'll hopefully make it instantly clear. Your networking, when you're testing your networking, you shouldn't use the client connection class, literally hard code that in. You shouldn't depend on that particular implementation. You should use an interface. So you can swap things around. So your lower level components should be decoupled from your higher level components. So you shouldn't literally use the database class in your video library code. You should use an interface that the database class satisfies or extends, implements, so you could sub other things in as well. And that means it's not, you shouldn't do it so that as you build your system in, you're locked into using particular things underneath. Yeah, particular instances, particular classes. You should use abstractions underneath. You should have interfaces everywhere. And the levels above should use interfaces to talk to the levels below. They shouldn't be hard coupled into them. Now, these interfaces would normally go with the code for the higher level stuff. So if you're writing your network um, big brother system, 
the big brother code needs to use this networking interface, to, to, and which will be instantiated by actual networking classes. So you'd put the networking interface in with your big brother code. And this is where the inversion comes, the sort of backwards to the normal way. So actually now to compile the lower level code, it actually needs that interface, doesn't it? So the lower level code actually depends on the upper level package because it needs the upper level package to get the, implement, the interface code. Yeah, the, the interface.java. Well, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's all abstract. I'm going to draw it on the board so it's concrete. All right, we've got the big brother class. It needs bigbrother.java. It's got code inside it. That code calls a method that needs to, it needs to go send. x.send to send a message to the server, say, or to the client, depending on which, what we're happening here. OK, now x is going to be of some type. And we're going to call that uh, connection x. And then we're going to equals, we'll initialize it somehow. So x is a connection. So we'd better have, now do we want connection to be an interface or a class? We want it to be an interface. If it was a class, then Big Brother would be locked into the details of, of, of the actual thing that it's using. It would be locked into the lower level implementation details. We, we don't want to lock ourselves into using a particular class to implement this. We want it to be abstract. So we're going to have an interface. Interface connection, and that's got a method called what? Send and receive. And then we'll finally write our actual one, which we'll call client. I can't remember. What, I can never remember. You've told me 50 times. I always forget. What is it? Client, client connection. Connection. And this will be class client connection implements connection. And then here's the actual code for send and receive. So the idea is this depends on the interface. It doesn't depend on that. So these guys are now decoupled. So you can rip this one out and stick in a mock one to test everything. That's one advantage of it. The dependency inversion principle says this in general is a good approach, not just for mocking, but in general it is because this guy here doesn't depend on particular instances. It just depends on the abstract properties of this or the interface. So, and why is it inversion? That's the point I was trying to make before. Oh yeah, so where are you going to put this interface file? Am I going to put it in the package that contains this? Or am I going to put it with the package that contains this? If they're in separate packages. Yeah, I'm going to put this in the Big Brother package. So the crazy thing now is to compile this, this lower level thing, it actually needs to reference the higher level package to compile the lower level package, which is backwards to how you'd expect things to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. Whew. And it needs it because it says here implements connection, right? So it needs to grab the connection.java file, which happens to be in that package. Whew. All right, good, 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 good. Uh, any questions? Yes? Does that pretty much mean that everything should have an Yeah, so we really like programming to interfaces. Now, in the past, people were completely nuts about it. These days, people are slightly less nuts about it. <laughs> but basically, whenever possible, program to an interface, don't program to an implementation. So make everything as abstract as possible and that's going to let you change things around and that's decoupling things so it's decreasing your cohesion. So yeah, so the annoying thing is, but thank heavens we've got Eclipse because it'll manage it for us, we're now going to need many more files than we thought we we're going to need because everything's going to be an interface rather than a class. Um, okay, so we've done dependency inversion principle. Do, 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 do. The jargon catchphrase for it, but uh, this never helps me remember what it means. What, what I told you before is how I remember it. Abstractions should not depend upon details. Details should depend upon abstractions. And Confucius first said that. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> if you are like me, as soon as you hear about this, you start thinking, how am I going to apply it? You think, oh, my networking thing. You think, oh, I'm going to set up my networking thing. I'm going to set it up with mock objects. I'm going to have mock connections. And you're thinking about it all, and you're starting to think, and then you suddenly think, oh, there's a problem. What's the, it's not a big problem, but what's the issue that you have to deal with to set it all up? It's a lot of work. No, no, it's not a lot of work. Oh, it's more work. 
Oh, it's a bit more work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Certainly don't do it if you don't need it. Yeah, yeah. But you do need it to test. I don't see how you can escape it with the testing. It's not much more work. Eclipse just does it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 he's got it. What is it? How's, I'm just trying to point to the thing. How's Big Brother going to know which of these things to use? In other words, when you build the system, how do you put the right one in? How, I, I glossed over it before. Remember when I drew this? I said, oh, yeah, it gets initialized somehow. How do you know when you're testing it, you want to initialize it to be the mock, give it the mock guy? And when you're running it live, you want it to be using your actual client connection. There's a couple of different ways. One is you could do it with ifs and all that sort of crap, or you could edit the code each time and things like that. But obviously, we don't want to do that. You can see that's a pain. It doesn't allow us to do automated testing and automated this and that. The trick that people use is something called dependency injection. <coughs> dependency injection means you've got some code, and this is dependent on something. It's dependent on x, but we're going to inject the x thing into it. We're not going to let this, this guy. In other words, let me say it better. Whose job is it to work out what sort of connection goes here? Whose responsibility is it to work out which particular connection class? You could say it's Big Brother's problem. And that's a normal way of doing it. You put ifs in here if, it's, if there's a debug flag set to true. Build it this way if a debug set. But really, it shouldn't be Big Brother's problem. You see, that's got nothing to do with Big Brother, really. Somehow, the x should just be injected into Big Brother, somehow. And you build Big Brother. And when you're building Big Brother, you inject an X in. Now, this whole thing about how we build classes is the very next thing we'll be looking at, which is construction. Con method and object construction, not method construction, construction methods, constructing objects is a really interesting thing. And there's lots of scope for improving our design. And that's what we'll be talking about obsessively on Thursday, constructions. And we'll look at some patterns called factory method and abstract factory and construction methods. And we'll look at all these really cool things. But let me just say now, insofar as it relates to this, we don't think it's Big Brother's job to work out who's providing the network service. That's really the person that's using Big Brother to decide that. They're using Big Brother when they're testing Big Brother, they should give him one sort of network service. If they're using Big Brother somewhere else, they should give him another network service. And perhaps there are other scenarios where you could give them further different um, services. So the idea is we should build Big Brother so X can be injected into it. And there are naively two ways of doing that. There are more elaborate, complex ways of doing it. But naively, there's two ways of letting the outside world give Big Brother the X. You could either do it when or when. Not compile and run. Or you could do a compile and run, but that's sort of fooling with the code. I'd, I'd really want to do it all at runtime. I don't want to have to change the code for testing and then change it for running. I want it to be the same code. Yeah. When you are, yeah, Big Brother. I want Big Brother to have a particular X. I want it to be parameterized by an X. Yeah. How could I tell Big Brother that X? You were just about to say it a second ago. I can even see the word starting to. When you construct it, yeah, yeah. When you make Big Brother, you could pass a construction. No, he said con, and then you sort of. Well, I could. I, I thought you were going to say construct. Yeah. So <laughs> when you construct a big when you construct a big brother, you could pass it in. Now Big Brother can't change its connection type then on, but then it's just up to the person that makes Big Brother, and that and that makes sense now. Your testing suite makes a big brother, injects a mock object in. Your production system makes a big brother, inject a real network in. That sounds cool. The downside is you can't change things at all, and it involves using construction methods, which is sometimes a pain for reasons that we'll see tomorrow. Construction Doing stuff at construction time is slightly problematic. But that's a reasonable way of doing it. And the other way of doing it is you could do it afterwards using getters and setters. You could have a get and set network thing. And that comes with all sorts of advantages, but it comes with all sorts of disadvantages, like do you want your client code to be able to change the underlying network in the middle of running and things like that? So who gets to run these getters and setters and things like that? Maybe you're going to have to make them package or protected or something to stop the outside world accessing them. OK, so they're the two different sorts of dependency injection that people commonly use. Does that make sense? Woohoo! Now, how long have we got? Oh. All right, well, and I, we have only two minutes. I'm going to talk briefly about Anzac Day. Can I just briefly? Because it's coming up, and I'm a patriotic guy. Because we're talking about censorship at the moment. Uh, and here's this neat quote from Robert Jackson. 
which is it's not the function of the government to keep the citizens from falling into error. It's a function of the citizen to keep the government from falling into error. He's talking about censorship here. Now, uh, the reason I started thinking about Anzac Day was while I was doing a bit of Googling for your fun censoring assignment that you're all working on at the moment, I came up with this beautiful quote from 11 years ago, and I marched in this protest when the first of the online censoring bills came in. Australia's had a long sequence of trying to censor the internet. And 11 years ago, almost to today, I think it was yesterday, um, uh, there was uh, introduced into the Senate a bill to try and censor the internet in 1999, just before Anzac Day. And here's what this really cool guy said. It is a sad statement I make on the day that we in Australia... Rem so he said it the day after it was passed into the Parliament. Awesome. He said it on Anzac Day, the 25th. It is a sad statement that I make on the day that we in Australia remember the Anzac heroes who fought in the First and Second World Wars to ensure that we had freedom of speech and the right of adults to be free. So they fought in the war to be sure we had freedom of speech and, and the right to be free. And I just thought, what a pile of crock. And I thought I should just briefly tell you something about Anzac Day, that in fact, that is completely not the case. And Australia is an incredibly censoring country and Anzac Day is even more tragic because of the censorship that happened. So here's the story. You probably all know most of this already because the current version of the Anzac legend as told in the film Gallipoli contains a lot of it. There have been very, very many versions of the story told over the years, everyone with a different slant and all, except the last one, strongly censored by the Australian government. The Australian government has always had very, very strong censorship, even stronger than in England. We're a remarkably censored country, possibly because of our geographical isolation. It made it possible for the Customs and Postmaster General to censor and control the flow of information in and out of Australia, possibly because we regarded England as our big brother or our dad and we were happy for them to make decisions for us and felt we weren't able to make decisions. But for whatever reason, we always had censorship. So when the Anzacs landed at um, Anzac Cove, which was a terrible mistake and a gaffe. It was the wrong place. Like just around the corner was a beautiful beach. You could have landed with no defences, but we landed on a small one entirely walled around by hills with Turkish fortifications on the top. They landed there because of an incredible blunder. And the whole, in fact, attack was an incredible blunder, organised by Churchill, who, once the news came out, completely resigned. The men landed there in this complete fiasco and were completely, constantly mown down. And it was a terrible, terrible battle and it lasted a terribly long time and it was atrocious and incompetently managed and it was a complete disaster. But because of the incredible stringent censorship that the Australian and English governments imposed, no news of this disaster was ever allowed to leak back. So the Australian, um, there was one reporter that always sent back these stirring stories, stirring stories of how brave the people were on the beaches and the Aussie bravery and the larrikinism and the bravery and the Aussie bravery. And that's the only story that the people back home got. And I didn't even know the whole thing was a complete disaster. In fact, kids today, a lot of kids that go to the Anzac ceremony, uh, that go over to Anzac Cove to celebrate it, are astonished to find that we actually lost that war and it was a military fiasco and debacle. Um, so... <laughs> Bizarrely enough, it was Rupert Murdoch's dad, Keith Murdoch, that blew the secret. He was visiting there on the way through and spoke to this one reporter who was sending back these outrageous stories that were incredibly heavily censored himself. And this guy said, we've just got to tell the English government, because the guy in charge of the whole thing isn't letting the news out, we've just got to tell them what a disaster and fiasco and debunkle this is and just stop it at once because people are just being mown down and killed for no reason. Yeah, it's an insane war in an insane place for an insane strategic goal. There was no reason. So um, Murdoch actually carried this letter, handwritten by the newspaper reporter, on his trip to England. Um, and he, it was very hard for him to even get to meet this other reporter because the army tried to keep him away from him. He carried the letter back to England and he was going to give it to the Prime Minister. But the army found out that he had this letter disclosing what was actually going on. And they actually arrested him and confiscated it in France just before he crossed the Channel and took the letter off him so he couldn't take it back and tell um, uh, Haig, I think, or whoever it was, uh, what was happening. But he rewrote it from memory, though he got it terribly wrong. Uh, and that got published in the papers and completely changed the tide of opinion in England. And everyone was just astonished at what an incompetent and terrible war it was, a battle this particular battle was. But even then in Australia, we still weren't allowed to know. So the English knew long about it. We just knew it was vaguely not going so well. At the same time, the English knew what a disaster and fiasco it was. And it was illegal in Australia to talk about it or even mention it. And one guy, one um, soldier came back from the war and he kept a diary, which was illegal. You weren't allowed to keep a diary because not because the censorship wasn't there to stop the Turks finding out what was going on, because the Turks already knew from the prisoners they captured. The censorship was there to stop the Australian public, find out what a disaster it was so people would stop volunteering. Yeah, it was a volunteering war, the first war, and going across. So it was just considered un-Australian to talk about what a disaster it was. So it was a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, eventually, the Brits 
uh, cancelled the whole operation, Churchill resigned, and it was a fiasco. But in Australia, still for many, many years, it was illegal to talk about it or think about it. A guy did publish his memoirs, and the Australian censor recalled all the books and had them pulped. Recently, about 90, in the 90, late 90s, his book was published again. And now, for the first time, we can actually read this thing that was a secret for a long time about what a disaster it was. So it was an example of censorship that the government didn't want the people to know. And I thought we should talk about it before we enter the Anzac week when we're all going to be talking about how brave the soldiers were, because they were terribly brave. But probably the bigger message is how incredibly incompetent and unwise it is to censor information from people and how we should be open about everything.